Hello everyone and welcome back to the Cyber Rangers YouTube channel. In this video, we're going to be picking up from where we left off in the previous video within the Introduction to C2 Frameworks video series. So in the previous video, we got a formal introduction to C2 Frameworks. We're now going to get an introduction or we're going to take a look at exactly how C2 Frameworks work. So what will we be covering exactly? Well, we'll be taking a look at the deployment models or the deployment infrastructure uh, typically utilized by adversaries or threats uh, in terms of C2 framework. So we'll be exploring the centralized model, the peer-to-peer -peer model, and this will give you a better understanding as to how the infrastructure of or what the infrastructure of a C2 framework looks like. Uh, and uh, this will then set the stage for uh, the demo of uh, some of the C2 frameworks we'll be exploring within this video series. So you'll have a better understanding as to why uh, we would use one specific C2 framework over the other based on the protocol and what our requirements are. With that being said, uh, let's get started and let's get an understanding as to how C2 frameworks work. Uh, how C2 frameworks work. Now, this is very important. I mentioned the centralized C2 model, so let's get into it a little bit more. So the centralized C2 model utilizes the traditional client-server communication model, where the compromised host, which is you can consider the client or the agent, will call back to a centralized C2 server awaiting further instructions. In this model, the C2 infrastructure is typically centralized in that the compromised host only communicates with a single master C2 server. All right, so that's the key thing to note here with the centralized model. You will typically have only one primary C2 server, okay? Now, that's not always the case because there can be a complex uh, infrastructure being utilized even in a centralized C2, uh, even in, within a centralized C2 deployment model. Now, what do I mean by this? In certain cases, you'll see that uh, they will have a primary or a master and slave server, something like that, where one of them is sort of a fallback uh, in the event that one of them you know, goes down or is, uh, is compromised, etc. But there's also uh, a a plethora of um, additional infrastructure that can be added around that. And uh, the way they would typically do this, uh, based on the uh, on the next point with, within the slide, is that uh, you'll typically see the inclusion of um, elements like redirectors, proxies, and load balancers, uh, not only to ensure the stability of the entire infrastructure of the, you know, the, the entire C2 infrastructure, because, you know, if you think about it from the perspective of an adversary, uh, they may have huge requirements with regards to, you know, how many uh, systems they have compromised uh, and all of that needs to be taken into account. So they'll utilize, uh, you know, load balancers and proxies, uh, you know, for that aspect of functionality, but they'll also use it to mask the IP addresses of, you know, key pieces of the infrastructure, namely the primary C2 server. So the way this would be, you know, typically set up is you have your primary C2 server, and then you can configure it to, you know, uh, communicate or to pass its traffic through a proxy. And uh, again, the agent or the actual payload or stager that you develop or the implant for lack of a better word, uh, can be configured to communicate or to filter or proxy traffic through the, um, the actual proxy server. And then the proxy server knows what to do with the traffic and sends it to the primary uh, C2 server. The, the point here is that uh, if someone was looking at egress traffic coming out of a compromised system, it would just uh, point towards the IP of the proxy server. And, uh, you know, proxy servers, in most cases, uh, in the in the cases uh, that I've seen, uh, APT groups, you know, will typically have kill switches uh, in key elements of the infrastructure. So if they realize that, you know, uh, someone is trying to break in or something like that, you know, they just wipe it, so on and so forth. And of course, I'll touch upon how uh, APT groups or threat groups uh, go about setting up the infrastructure or go about performing resource development, uh, primarily because, you know, if they are going to be setting up a C2 server somewhere on the internet, uh, the VPS provider that they utilize will obviously not uh, have any information that could link them to the acquisition of that server for whatever, you know, purposes they used it for. So you'll typically see uh, OPSEC is a will play a big role with regards to how adversaries um, how adversaries plan out to begin uh, to begin with their C2 infrastructure and again this will become clear as we uh, clear as we proceed so the key uh, takeaway here is that most well-designed centralized C2 infrastructure uh, 
will also have inbuilt kill switches, which I pointed out. And uh, this is usually a defense against security researchers or law enforcement. And another thing to note uh, with regards to the centralized C2 model is that an increasingly popular trend with centralized C2 infrastructure is the use of advanced multi-channel stages or payloads that are designed to establish communication with more than one C2 server simultaneously. So this is something that's, uh, that's relatively new and it is extremely powerful because you can uh, you can actually configure a stager or a payload uh, or in the context now of a properly set up infrastructure, the, you can configure the agent to connect to more than one C2 server simultaneously, which is again, as you can tell, uh, this will increase the overall complexity of the adversary C2 infrastructure, and it makes it much more complex and time consuming to, you know, from the defender's perspective or an analyst perspective to identify the primary C2 server that is being used to communicate with a compromised host, uh, considering the fact that there is a complex uh, infrastructure, uh, underlying infrastructure behind the entire, um, behind, uh, behind the entire deployment. So. Uh, a few diagrams will help explain this. So this is an example of what a centralized uh, C2 model is, or, or rather how it works. Uh, so in this particular case, you can see that you have your command and control server. This is the primary C2 server. And then you have your red team operators all patching into the server, either directly or via the use of a client uh, or an interface, which is on their system. So that again, uh, OPSEC is usually a big deal at this point uh, still because uh, communication between any server needs to be uh, masked accordingly. Uh, because uh, if you analyze or you perform an analysis on a particular actor and you realize that they connected to a C2 server for whatever reason, then of course that's uh, an indication of guilt and involvement in the entire, uh, in the entire operation. Uh, but in this case, you can see that um, this is using a very basic um, basic complex infrastructure the representation is basic but the underlying concept is that you can have tons of redirectors and uh, and or proxies so what happens is that the c2 server is configured to communicate with a redirector the redirector is then configured to communicate with the uh, with a set of agents or a specific agent uh, right over here so the point i'm trying to make here is that instead of just having the uh, target system call back to the command and control server, you're now sort of uh, isolating the command and control server and uh, sort of preventing anyone, at least in the organization right over here, from knowing or identifying the actual IP address of the C2 server. So monitoring egress traffic in this particular case would uh, reveal that it is connecting to a particular IP or domain. However, you know, that is just a simple redirector or a proxy. Uh, and, you know, as I said, that uh, will not give you any ideas to what the um, the actual origin uh, C2 server is or the master uh, C2 server is. So again, just the way this works is you can have, you know, more than one redirector here and they can be configured for different use cases or for different communication channels. In this case, this is a simple um, uh, HTTP uh, HTTPS uh, C2 framework, which means communication is facilitated over those protocols. Um, so again, this is the target network here. We're assuming that, you know, initial access has already been uh, established. Uh, you get your stager to run somehow uh, or your payload, and then the payload is configured uh, to connect to uh, either one of these redirectors based on the way you've configured it. And uh, yeah, so that's uh, what the centralized C2 model looks like, typically speaking. Uh, we then have the peer-to-peer -peer C2 model. This is one that's very interesting, but not that widely utilized on a large scale. And I'll explain why. In this particular case, the communication from the C2 server is delivered through a web of botnet members that relay the commands or instructions between them. In this model, no single member of the botnet network is the master C2 server, making it very difficult to identify where the commands or instructions uh, originated from. A P2P model, a peer-to-peer -peer C2 model, typically utilizes a single compromised host, uh, or more than one, actually, I should point that out, to maintain communication with the C2 server, whereby all the uh, other compromised hosts communicate over a botnet network or a peer-to-peer -peer network and transmit information through a single egress host. Now, what does this mean? That's uh, very confusing to understand. Uh, 
If you take a look at this uh, diagram here, this is your traditional uh, centralized uh, C2 deployment model where you have a client, a C2 client communicating with the C2 server to then in, uh, issue instructions to uh, various, uh, you know, systems running implants or, you know, uh, various compromised systems with agents on them. And they all in turn communicate to this single C2 server. And uh, the C2 client is again, just used as a way of uh, sort of interacting with all of the implants via the C2 server. So this is uh, the typical centralized model where, as you can see, everything goes uh, to the C2 server, regardless of whether there's additional infrastructure here, like a redirector, etc. Now, with a peer-to-peer -peer C2 uh, deployment model or infrastructure, the C2 server and the C2 client aspect stays the same. However, what, you, what will end up happening here is you can have that complex infrastructure of redirectors and proxies, uh, and they can all be, again, you gain access to one system within a network of other systems, so let's say an internal network, and then you decided that single system or maybe another system within the the network uh, you can you know via uh, this this access uh, can be obtained via pivoting however you you determine that uh, let's say one particular system within a company's internal network will be the single egress point or the point of communication egress communication out of the network now the way this works is that uh, once you've configured that uh, single host within the network uh, to be the egress point uh, once you start taking over the network step by step or system by system, you configure all of those systems to communicate with that single, with that host that has been configured to be the egress point. The point is that uh, now you don't have all of these connections coming back to the C2 server. All the communication is coming through that single uh, egress point, which again is a compromised system that has been configured for that particular use case. Now, in situations where I've seen this being deployed is where you have an internal network with a lot of systems and they typically, an adversary will typically pick a system that is not being uh, as monitored or is not being heavily monitored, maybe doesn't have uh, specific security constraints on it, you know, stuff like that. Uh, either way, they, or they essentially configure the stages they run on all of the other systems to utilize the single egress point or to communicate with the single egress point. So it's sort of uh, a way of having a miniature C2 server within the, the organization's internal network. Uh, but of course, no critical information apart from just, uh, you know, data is being sent. Um, so that's the peer-to-peer -peer C2 model. This is, as I said, not, it's not widely de uh, deployed by, um, by adversaries, not anymore. At one point it was, but Again, uh, there's many C2 frameworks that support this. One, uh, the most popular one that does it really well, at least in my opinion, is uh, is Havoc. I'll probably be able to show you that, but uh, that's what it looks like. Uh, where you know you you can choose to utilize your initial foothold or the system that you got your your initial foothold on as the egress point. Uh, you then have the third type. Um, of uh, you know the third uh, the third C two deployment model and that is the overt or out of band uh, C two model. Uh, now this one is increasing in popularity. Uh, this C two model leverages already existing communication protocols and social media platforms, IRC, email, uh, and many more to facilitate the C two infrastructure. But more importantly, to facilitate the communication channels. So the primary motivation for using this model is to take advantage of already existing platforms like Twitter or Gmail as means of communicating with compromised hosts running the implants with the aim of evading detection. So this C2 model can be very difficult to detect as egress traffic is in the form of communication with services like Twitter or Gmail, which in most cases is going to be uh, marked as non-suspicious. Now, uh, you may be asking yourself, well, how is this facilitated? There's one of them that I was actually taking a look at uh, that will not be covering because of the complexity of setting it up. But the way it works is you create a Twitter account and you uh, essentially uh, open a developer account and uh, you essentially get the API tokens, the access tokens, et cetera. And with this particular Twitter C2 framework, uh, the way it works is that uh, you, you essentially utilize uh, Twitter to relay communication between the server and the, and the uh, the actual implants in the form of Twitter direct messages. So there's also other ones that utilize email, which is much more common because this is SMTP or communication over SMTP. But if you can actually imagine this um, in the case of Twitter, if you're monitoring the egress traffic and you, you know it just looks like someone is browsing through Twitter because again, 
it's communicating with a single profile so that may be detected uh, so you want to be very careful about that but probably on day three if i can showcase this i'll try and do that because it's uh, it's really really cool all right so that is how c2 frameworks work in a nutshell and uh, now that we have this understanding as to how they work and the deployment models or the deployment infrastructure or architecture we can actually take a look at some examples of some popular c2 frameworks and that's exactly what we're going to be doing in the next video so in the next video within this series we're going to be taking a look at arguably one of the most popular c2 frameworks and that is powershell empire so to stay tuned for that, uh, make sure you're subscribed to the Cyber Rangers YouTube channel. If you found value in this video, please share it. Uh, if you have any comments, questions or feedback, uh, you can uh, post them in the comment section below. And with that being said, I will be seeing you in the next video.